and Gender Studies and Professor of Political Science at Queens, who will be presenting Marxism versus Feminism, Reflections on Epistemological Dissonance. Okay, thank you. Um, what I wanted to talk about is just a few reflections on why it's taken um, quite a lot of effort and quite a lot of imagination to get to this point, um, to have a discussion like this, and, and why in an ongoing way um, there is still a kind of resistance in a certain strand of Marxism to the contributions of feminism. And I'm grateful to the Historical Materialism Canada um, location um, as providing an indication that it's not the only strand of Marxism. So the analytical relationship between Marxism and feminism, or what's been commonly referred to in earlier iterations as the women question, has obviously engaged leftist practice um, since at least the time of Marx and Engels. August Bebel's Women Under Socialism, which was published in 1883, and Frederick Engels' Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, published the year later in 1884, have long been considered sort of the canons um, within, within Marxism. The conversation has proven to have considerable longevity and with good reason. Socialist feminist analysis, as we've heard today as a moment of this, has had a profound effect in advancing contemporary Marxism, developing our understanding of core concepts and pivotal issues. These include, and this is just a partial list, the role of social reproduction, the role of domestic labor, the relationship between the private and public spheres, the nature of the working class, the role of gender and sexuality in shaping state ideology and hegemony. So all of these are, you know, sort of, to my mind, incontestable contributions to Marxism. However, there are some strands of Marxism, and this is, this is not, you know, a self-identified phenomenon. Um, and there are also strands of leftist practice that consider themselves either relating to or crediting or part of the um, contribution of Marxist analysis, which continue to be resistant. And the resistance takes a variety of forms. It can take avoidance, it can take the form of caution, or it can take the form of overt hostility. And in activist circles and progressive social movement settings, the manifestations seem to be quite widespread um, with the capacity to reproduce over generations and are also increasingly well documented. In a 2011 article uh, titled Deconstructing Militant Manhood by Laura Montesinos Coleman and Serena Bassi, um, the authors identify patterns of gendered hierarchical performance in contemporary social movement case studies in Britain. They note a pattern that actually was identified, it was referred to earlier, by Sheila Robottom as early as the 1970s. There's now literature that's identifying patterns of exclusion that are taking place in terms of the World Social Forums. Um, it's been common in terms of sections of the Global South, people refer to machismo, and so on. And the question that I want to ask is, how do we explain a notable continued intransigence within the left, specifically on uh, some sections of the Marxist left, to feminist critique, despite the overwhelming impact of this advance in critical scholarship and its lessons for activist and social practice. And the reflections that I'd like to share is that I think the resistance is rooted in a problematic epistemological framing, resulting in a kind of dichotomy where there's a narrow sense of a certain type of Marxism and an ascribed sense of a certain type of feminism, where this feminism meets this type of Marxism with a sense of dissonance, with a sense of of not asking the questions in the way in which Marxism asks the questions. And I call this epistemological dissonance. So such an epistemological stance is of course challenged by many other strands of Marxism that see feminism or feminisms as helpful in Marxist theory and practice. And such alternative um, approaches obviously suggest a whole lot of you know, other types of questions. I'm not going to get into any of those, and I'm not going to be uh, trying to revisit the debates or the issues, because my effort is really to look at what in total would appear to be an epistemological stance that is resistance to feminism in the name of advanced Marxist theory and high quality Marxist practice. And to this end, I identify four elements or what I call dimensions that collectively comprise these epistemological 
um, parameters to this constructed Marxism. And these are, one, in the view of temporality, two, idealized masculinities, three, a sense of totality and its relationship to class, race, and gender, and four, the relationship of activism to the academy. And each of these elements reinforce one another collectively to maintain something that's understood as knowledge, not just in terms of the issues that are discussed, but in terms of the questions that are considered to be askable, in terms of the way in which problems are actually posed. So um, to just sort of briefly discuss this in terms of epistemology, and then I'll go through the, the four sections, and then I'll conclude with a little bit of a, of a sense of where, um, where I fit into this debate. So, if epistemology is the study of theory and nature in terms of uh, grounds of knowledge, which includes limits, limits to validity, then it's reasonable to ask this question because there are Marxists who are using exactly the same core texts and identifying themselves positionally in exactly the same places within Marxism who come to completely dichotomous conclusions. So we can't simply identify this as a question of a theoretical issue or a contribution. So just to give one, ad, um, one example, I have a longer paper if anybody wants to get into more detail, but in terms of Rydaniskaya, that Sandra mentioned, mentioned Rydaniskaya um, explicitly sees the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and 70s as a direct extension and a contribution coming from her reading of Marx's original framework in terms of self-emancipation. She understands herself as a student of Rosa Luxemburg. She understands the Soviet example and Stalinism as a, a counter-revolution and so on. Alternatively, Tony Cliff, also grounded in the theory of state capitalism and Stalin, uh, about Stalinist Russia, also a student of Rosa Luxemburg, also emphasizing the self-emancipation of the working class, explicitly sees the 1960s women's liberation movement in the United States as a dangerous threat to the emancipatory movement of the working class, and he, and he articulates that uh, explicitly. So the, the, the reason I've sort of just moved this into a question of, of um, epistemology is it's been unsatisfying to look at this only in terms of the debates. And the other point is that I don't only want to deal with the intellectual um, resistance, but what epistemology does is it also tells us about affect. It's not just a way of knowing, it's actually a way of feeling known. And in that context, there is this repeated pattern of common feelings and patterns of exclusion that are gendered and hierarchical and repeat themselves even in the most progressive circles that are consciously trying to overcome precisely those features. I'll give you an example. Um, this is a quote from Dorothy Smith, who's a well-known uh, Marxist feminist in, in Canada, who uh, wrote in a 2005 publication echoing something she had originally developed in 1973 as follows. Trying to become engaged politically in ways on the left and in relation to Marxists has been an extremely painful and difficult experience. What you generally find among Marxists is rejection of feminism. It is exactly the same rejection we experience in almost every other encounter that we have outside the women's movement. How Marxists, whether social democrats or Marxist-Leninists, respond to us as feminists does not differ from how we are responded to by the ruling class, the upstairs people. So what I'm trying to do here is not um, alter this pattern. I'm simply trying to name it, and in naming it, to see if there's some way that we can you know, come to some kind of sense of what, what to do with it. So the first element, temporality. The Marxist tradition is closely associated with specific historical moments. And there's often this discussion of the notion of revolutionary continuity. That notion is deeply embedded in individual theorists and certain types of events. So notable are the writings of Karl Marx, obviously, Frederick Engels, Vladimir and Lenin. The Russian Revolution of 1917 is seen as a formative moment when the abstract critique of capitalism developed by Marx and Engels moves from theory to practice, and Marxism then emerges as a globally recognized guiding framework for working class revolutionary transformation. The intense conflict between Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin then becomes a, a point of, of, of division, and we end up with a fragmentation. Clearly, we have many Marxisms. I mean, if we didn't have them before that time, Marx said we did, but then that clearly follows. The Communist International then becomes pivotal, um, and for those who are part of the emancipatory tradition of the Trotsky wing, the first four Congresses are seen as particularly formative. So the point about this, this temporality is that there is a common sense often of a kind of 
um, epistem epistemological nostalgia, the sense that things used to be better than they are now. And the nostalgia can actually be transferred to more modern periods in different ways. So it can relate to, and can go to different places. So it can be, we were better off in the 1930s in Europe, or we were better off in the 1960s in the United States. But the framing is, by and large, one that looks back and thinks that things were better then. Now, this um, is, is encountered um, as a way that is closed to a type of other thinking, which is uh, a feminist thinking around waves of history. So I don't have time to go into the whole detail, but feminist thinking about history, um, and again, this is highly contested, largely uses this metaphor where the history and development of the women's movement um, in the 1960s, 70s is seen as the second wave. It's read backwards to the period of the suffragette movement, called the first wave, and it's read forwards or present, where the third wave is often identified as one where there is a recognition of intersectionality, where gender, race, class, um, sexual orientation, age, ability, national position, and so on, are, are actually understood as all being parts of the system that we're trying to critique. So the notable feature of the waves metaphor for the purposes of exploring epistemological dissonance is that the temporal frame is not about individuals, and it assumes an understanding that things that looked radical at one time for a certain generation living at the time could look conservative when you're looking at them at another time. So it's a very different sort of way of thinking about time and thinking about space. And it also incorporates the understanding of backlash, where things might have been more progressive in the past, and they could be more regressive now, but something might have happened in between in order to alter that frame. Let me move to idealized masculinities. A separate but not unrelated dimension is the way in which individuals are ascribed to have certain characteristics which are seen as ideal types. So I radicalized in the 1970s. We used to wear buttons or badges more commonly. One that was very common was, we'll all get along just fine as long as you know I'm Lenin. There was this understanding that the Lenin persona, the Lenin persona had certain types of characteristics to it. In more contemporary and certainly more sophisticated terms, Coleman and Bassey that I quoted before, have developed this um, understanding of sort of idealized types based on some case study analysis that they did in, in Britain in um, solidarity organizations and anti-globalization uh, organizations. Where they talked about um, a phenomenon that was recurring, and they, they, they titled them. One is called Man with Analysis, and the other is called the Anarchist Action Man. Um, and the authors identify how the hegemonic man with analysis operates within sort of coalition organizations in a very competitive model, and the only way to really challenge the man with analysis and his authority in terms of sort of group dynamics is for a competitive man with analysis to present, to go into the ring and to duke it out. Um, and this becomes exclusive of other types of knowledges, including people from the Latin American region, women, young people, and men with alternative masculinities. The second persona, Amethyst Action Man, appears quite different than Man with Analysis, but ends up with being similarly exclusive. Now, in terms of Marxist analysis, um, this, this struck me as, as being a useful way of understanding the epistemology of, of masculinities, but I wanted to add another figure who I call Communist Urgent Man. <laughs> so the nostalgia of historic moments is coupled with the sense that there are particular opportunities that are facing us that many of us can't see. But the Communist Urgent Man knows that we have to respond to that moment, and there is absolutely no time for processes or discussion or inclusive practices. And certainly discussions by Communist Urgent Man can't waste any time. Um, and there is some understanding that the only person who knows that this is urgent is the urgent man, and the other people around them become seen as obstructionist and wasting time. So all of these are idealized persona, but the point that I'm trying to get across is that the epistemological dissonance embeds itself in these hegemonic masculinities that then become naturalized and become very, very difficult to challenge, even in places where we're trying to organize against them. Third, totality, class, race, and gender, and gender, I'm running out of time. I got it, okay. Um, this trend of Marxism tends to assume that there is something called a class analysis 
which is dichotomous and um, opposite to something called a feminist analysis. And class is seen as a totalizing category that catches all of these other elements and includes them within its capacity. The dissonance, at least in part, follows, of course, from the temporality, because the nostalgic framework assumes that even the ruling class from previous times is much the same as the ruling class in present times. So you commonly get this situation where the Russian Tsar state of the late 19th and early 20th century is, is compared to the United States of the 1930s and 1960s, which is then compared to whatever particular state you happen to be in, Canada, the US, the UK, and so on. Class is therefore a totalizing category, not only about the way we think of the working class, but also the way we think of the ruling class. In terms of the working class, um, you know, there's an extensive discussion about class and gender, about class and race, and there are readings of Marxism where class is seen as basically being similar to the sociological category of work, which is actually not the way Marx used the notion of class as a social, as a social category. But the idea of thinking about life and work and class relations as something that happens 24 hours a day tends to be this type of Marxism as something that is dissonant. If we think of Rosemary Hennessy's critique, for example, what she says is if we understand desire as a class act, we obviously start to think about class in a very different way. And there are many, many feminist theorists, including Angela Davis, we can go on and on and on, who have actually helped us to understand class in a way where race and gender are not simply specific objects of things that we study, but that racialized and gendered mechanisms through which classes live become a theoretical category. So finally, activism in the academy. The final element, and I know I'm out of time here, um, is of the epistemological dissonance is this relationship with the academy. Marxism has generally emerged outside of the mainstream university system, and this is because bourgeois institutions of elite knowledge production don't allow for critique, and there, you know, there's the McCarthy era, there have been all sorts of eras that have resisted um, Marxism, but in the 1960s and 1970s, the new left was largely based on a student movement which fought for access to the universities. And there has actually been an expanding relationship in terms of intellectual life around the role of critique, not without difficulty and so on and so forth. Secondly, feminism similarly emerged out of the same period of radicalization as the new left and has developed unconsciously identified ambivalent relationship with the university, specifically, specifically through women and gender studies. And I'll simply say that there are many, many Marxist feminists and socialist feminists who house themselves with all the ambivalences in women and gender studies. And there are many Marxists, particularly man with analysis, who houses himself, it can be to her, but you know, comfortably in universities. But it's almost impossible to imagine a conscious, active, and friendly dialogue between man with analysis and feminist studies, even in terms of organizing, even in terms of looking at the university system. And of course, communist urgent man has very little time. So um, that type of process wouldn't happen. So just to conclude, um, my, my interest in sort of identifying this dissonance comes largely from my own experience of many decades of life on the left and also as um, a scholar and a researcher. And in my life on the left, I've been part of a movement um, which uh, was largely influenced by Tony Cliff and the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain, who explicitly argued that feminism was a danger to Marxism. And in my own life and my work here in Canada, um, I have found exactly the opposite, that feminism actually enhances our understanding of Marxism. And so, to my mind, this dissonance is not simply a question of an individual or a place or whatever, it's something that's happened in my own head. And I am now at a point where I find that dissonance unacceptable. And so I think naming it is sort of a feature of being able to, to move forward.